tool. The title of the session is Testing an Online Anxiety Tool for Youth. Uh, and we have with us Dr. Lori Wozni and uh, Dr. Patrick McGrath from the IWK Health Center. Uh, as you can see, we have the Knowledge Exchange Network up on the screen. Uh, the, this presentation is being recorded, uh, and we do have our recordings up on this Knowledge Exchange Network. This registration information here in the middle will be replaced with the recording when it's available, usually in a couple, uh, in two or three days. Uh, for example, we do have our last presentation, our last webinar is, is available, uh, which is a great presentation on the fire and evacuation of the Children's Hospital in Winnipeg that some of you may have seen uh, in, on the news a number of months ago in the winter. Uh, it was a great presentation hearing straight from the folks at Winnipeg Children's Hospital about uh, how they evacuated the, the um, pretty much the entire Children's Hospital. Uh, so it's a great presentation. Have a have a look at that if you do have uh, have time. Um, so without any further ado, we'll be handing the uh, presentation over to uh, Dr. McGrath and Dr. Wozni. Dr. Patrick McGrath is uh, the Integrated Vice President of Research at the IWK and the Capital District Health Authority, uh, which is the, uh, the the health authority that includes the Halifax uh, region in Nova Scotia. And he's also a professor of psychology, pediatrics and psychology and research chair at Dalhousie University. Uh, Dr. Wozni is a postdoctoral fellow at the IWK and a PhD uh, in, in educational technology with a special focus on performance, human performance technologies and distance education. And she's been working with uh, the, the intelligent research and intervention software a platform that delivers customized web-based behavioral innovations. And they're going to be sharing with us this usable, usability study, which is part of a larger project uh, regarding this online uh, uh, anxiety tool for youth. So that being said, I'll hand the virtual podium over to uh, Dr. Wozniak. Hello everyone, um, from a sunny Halifax, Nova Scotia. Um, I'm very excited to be having a chance to just chat with you about a project that we've been working on for about a year now. My name, as Doug said, is Dr. Lori Wozni, and I'm just a sort of a postdoc working under the supervision of Dr. McGrath and also Dr. Mandy Newton, who works um, in the Department of Pediatrics at the University of Alberta. And for the last year, our team has been working with web developers and programmers, media producers, clinicians, youth volunteers, and our, and our entire research team to really work at building a beta version of an online tool for anxious youth. And specifically for youth who have visited the emergency department with a mental health crisis and how we can use an online tool to sort of follow up with them and provide support to them after they've visited that the emergency department. So thanks for joining with us today. I think it's going to be a good session and uh, I hope you find some things interesting and you can help us, help us sort of point ourselves in the next direction for the next steps for our project. Um, this is really more for those who are going to be looking at the session a little later and want to come back and kind of jump in later on. I just always like to give a little roadmap for where our session's going to go. But really, I thought I'd sort of break up our our time today into three um, three sections. First, we're going to briefly just going to talk a little bit about some of those issues around youth and anxiety, access to services, how youth are accessing resources for mental health and particularly for anxiety. What do we know about what youth's preferences are for, for receiving these kinds of supports and resources? And that will be a good, really good primer, I think, for us to talk about um, building these kinds of online tools and some of the problems and challenges and opportunities that they provide. Um, and then second, we'll sort of do a little walkthrough of our web-based tool. And I'm going to show you some of the components, some of the features and functionalities, and how um, Wired, which is sort of the, was the original name that we gave our, our tool when we first started, we actually just completed a, a nationwide contest for youth to propose names to rename it. So, um, But the original name was Wired. So we're going to go do a little walkthrough of, of Wired and what Wired looks like, what the components are, and how we went ahead went and built it. And then I think we'll spend a little bit of time, not much, but I thought at the end it might be kind of useful in terms of the usability study that we've just started over the summer and where we're going to talk a little bit about some of those risks and rewards with the user experience testing and how you try to build these tools and make sure that they are as widely um, accepted and used, there's no point in really building tools that aren't going to be used. So we'll talk a little bit about how we can um, how we can move forward and, and to make the best of that usability, those usability data that we have. 
So, I mean, I think it's really hard today to be to really go anywhere in terms of popular media. If it's your Twitter account, your Facebook account, reading your local news, reading blogs. Um, I, I'm a parent myself, and I run into parents all the time at, at the ball field and at the hockey rink, and everybody's sort of talking a lot about youth mental health and issues and where do we go and who do we who do we talk to and where who can youth talk to trying to find figure out where youth can go and how they can access the kind of supports and resources that they need is really critical. Um, you know, in terms of where youth would like to access support, um, it's trying to find better ways of understanding if they want to access that information through peers, through teachers, through experts, through their parents, um, trying to figure out when youth would like to access help. You know, what kind of services are available in that 9 to 5 window? What kind of services are available in evenings or on weekends or when they're in a crisis or they're at school? Having a better understanding of where we can go and what we can do with an online environment that isn't currently being supported by the traditional Additional kinds of methods and models um, is really important and we know today with youth being so connected you know trying to have a better under understanding of how important being able to access those things on their phone or on the web or wherever they are whenever they need it um, is really critical so sometimes those stories we hear are tragic and sometimes they're really good but they all sort of point us to the issue that we need to be thinking more about um, not just providing access but understand having a better understanding of where when why and how youth um, our needs are being met and this is I think this is really important in terms of the transition phase that we're in right now between sort of traditional models and really trying to incorporate more of an e-health and online support for for youth and for, for not just for youth but for other for other people as well and so trying to figure out can we combine some of these tools you know in with traditional service delivery or can we also can we can we move them completely online and have them as standalone um, standalone support programs. Um, I don't think the point really today is to sort of get too far into details about um, sort of research on anxiety and anxiety disorders, but I just thought as a, as a way to help us understand the number of youth that could be helped with these kinds of tools um, online. We do know that anxiety is extremely common um, for youth and in particular in Canada we know that Youth by the age of 16, 10% of all youth are experiencing symptoms of anxiety that are severe enough that, that they require um, treatment. So I don't think anyone could sort of um, say that the need for, for making sure that we meet these needs and are, are addressing these issues that we have um, isn't important and trying to figure out a way that these online tools might be able to help us reach those youth and, and deal with that is really important. And when we think about onset, I think this graph is sort of an interesting thing for us to think about because we know that anxiety and other and other mental health illnesses and and issues like depression and substance abuse and substance dependence, that the this is sort of a sort of to give you an overview of age of onset and age of diagnosis. One thing we're always obviously concerned about is making sure that you know when when a, when a youth is first symptomatic of something, they're also able to get the right, the correct diagnosis within a short time period. But we're also interested in understanding that for a lot of youth, these things are happening at, a lot of these things are, are sort of all happening at the same time. And understanding that early onset of anxiety can follow a chronic course and can really significantly interfere with youth's relationships, with how they're performing at school, and with their ability to sort of function in, in a daily way, be able to, you know, work for, um, hold down a part-time job or be able to sort of work and work towards other other goals they have for their future. So we know that meeting with, identifying and be able to work with youth when, when they're first really work dealing with these issues is really critical. Um, and especially for the teenage years, and our, the tool that we've developed is really targeted for the ages of thir 13 to 17. And we know in that kind of time frame, youth are, are undergoing such an incredible changes both development, developmentally and also just in terms of their environment. On the academic side, we talk a lot about that those transition years between elementary to junior high, and from junior high to high school, and all of the things that go with that, and the difficulty that a lot of a lot of children and youth have in making those transition times. Um, but we also know that at that then those teen years, puberty, um, experiences with dating, experiences with new schools, and new kinds of peer experiences all contribute to. Um, us seeing, you know, an uptake in, an, an uptick in the number of, of youth that are experiencing um, anxiety, and especially evident for social anxiety disorder, which research has shown us is a twofold incre increase in those teenage years. So, um, 
you know, it's something that we want to be able to get to early and be able to, you know, start working on so that we can reduce some of those potential long-term effects. You know, and what's interesting, and Doug's going to do a little audience question here with us, but one of the things that's really interesting is that for as, as common as it is, and as many youth that struggle and deal with anxiety, um, it's really often undertreated and un untreated or undertreated in young people. And there's a lot of reasons for this, and we're going to talk a little bit about some of the barriers for youth and some of the barriers within our system, but um, a few of them are just that youth tend to not seek for professional help. There's been some research about um, help seeking strategies strategies for youth. We know there's some th some things happening in our health our current healthcare system that's making it more difficult for for youth to access services. We know that young people and their parents tend to prefer um, more informal and, and general sources of help over specialist mental health services. So there's a lot of things going on that are that are contributing to this this group of disorders sort of being undertreated in our youth population and we know with what the effects that it has it's really important that we, we start to address that. Um, and we also know that left untreated and undertreated, these anxiety disorder disorders make youth much more vulnerable to having more of a major mental health crisis. And so we see a lot of a lot of youth coming to the emergency departments in uh, you know in Canada and the United States, trying to deal with and find access to services for anxiety. So yeah, our our audience question, my audience question, first audience question was really just what percentage of children with a diagnosable mental health disorder receive specialist care in Canada. All right, so we've opened up the poll there, um, and as Dr. Wozni uh, mentioned, what percentage of children with a diagnosable mental health disorder receive specialist care? And you can see the various ranges there. So uh, all you have to do is just reach up and click, uh, click your, make your selection by clicking on the screen on the appropriate little bubble there, and it'll be recorded. And we'll, we'll flip the results back to the audience in a second once everyone has a chance to respond. And we can see that uh, the majority, 66%, have said that 15 to 20% of children receive diagnosable mental health or with a diagnosable mental health disorder receive specialist care, followed Great. by, by four, 4 to 7%. Great. Well, we have a very smart group here this morning. So that, I mean, I think that really is what's important for us to understand is that significant portions of our of our population are not are not accessing specialist care, um, and it, and part of it is probably because this, our system is sort of oriented more toward the provider. So you're, we tend to be giving people what we want to give them, and not necessarily what they need. But there are obviously some other other issues that play a role in in whether or not people access those services that are available to them. Um, thinking about building these online tools is about how do we open that up and give people um, other options and other opportunities. And we do know that there's a lot of information available for youth and mental health care and that there are currently access points for youth to access information and access um, support. You know, when we think about traditional mental health services, your traditional counseling, psycho psychology and psychiatry services, um, youth accessing information and resources through their primary care physicians, their general practitioners. Um, we see a big movement um, connecting schools in Ontario. They've been putting social workers in the school system um, inside the schools to sort of help work with youth um, at closer proximity and try to work out those, those issues that connect families and schools and mental health. Um, complementary and alternative medicine. Obviously people are looking to the internet and to the web for, for access to resources and help and support and help how to and where to go. Um, Self-help books. If there's an incredible number of workbooks for youth and anxiety for teens and anxiety for girls, anxiety for boys. Um, and as we mentioned a little bit earlier, also the emergency department and the hospital. And I just put a couple of pictures over there because I think I think we forget how many resources and spaces there are providing information. When you think about the number of apps that are available now for depression and anxiety and mood check-ins and mood trackers, um, a lot of youth and a lot of people in general are accessing these this information. Um, not all of them grounded on research, not all of them, you know, based on, on good best on what we know about evidence of best practice. There's some great websites out there that provide youth with lots of peer support and a lot of informational um, support. So they can go and look at stories of other youth. They can find out information about different um, different kinds of anxiety, but not really sort of a therapeutic, more just as a support and an informational resource. And there are a couple of um, there are a couple of programs, the Mood, Mood Gym being one of them. Um, 
um, that's sort of referenced a lot that are and new tools that are being developed all the time to sort of deal with different aspects of mental health depression um, tra post-traumatic stress um, anxiety problems with sleep so there's a lot of different tools that are out there um, but a lot but I, I think the point that I wanted to make was a lot of times they're they're really information focused and not that that's bad and they're often connected and trying to connect youth to services and connect youth to each other and connect and help youth sort of navigate how to find resources but they aren't themselves a resource they aren't always themselves an actual sort of therapeutic or clinical intervention to help youth actually overcome the, the struggles that they're facing so I think that's really important to know there's a lot of there's a lot of ways that youth are trying to access support and in our case, we were really, really interested in thinking about how emergency departments, how we can connect with as that as a point of access. And we know that um, you know when caregivers come to the emergency department, their top concerns are really related to basic safety and emotional distress. And that those top stressors that are identified by youth and caregivers in those circumstances are really issues related to school, issues related to sort of parent the parenting relationship, conflict with parents, and problems that youth are having with with peers and friends. Um, and I think what's really interesting about that, and this little this little graph here, on this little table, sorry, um, what I think sort of shows some interesting things is if you look under sort of mental health needs and you look at anxiety, um, zero being things that were that were scored by the clinician as needing no action, one being things that the clinician scored as needing what need for a need for watchful waiting, and two being things that required a need for action three being things that required immediate or intensive action, you can see that really a significant portion of, of youth who, who are coming to the emergency department for an anxiety related um, problem are really being scored in the clinician's perspective as something that doesn't need that doesn't need immediate act doesn't need really need immediate action um, and I think that that's a really important if, if youth are coming to the emergency department to access resources and a lot of times their level of need according to the clinician is not really urgent um, we need to be thinking about well what are we doing with those youth if this is their first real access point um, access point to the healthcare system for mental health services um, and I think that that's really important because when a youth and or their parents recognize that a youth is experiencing really significant life stressors related to anxiety or, or even depression, which you know is highly related to anxiety, um, that for a lot of them um, it's extremely worrisome and they're, they're very concerned. And so what might not be urgent to the clinician is still urgent to the family. We need to think about how do we provide the right kind of education and support that's going to make that transition from their emergency department visit to, the, to their follow-up care that may not come for three or four weeks in some cases um, through their primary care physician or our incendiary uh, resources, how do we help make that transition better? So that was really the impetus for our, our, um, our tool, is really trying to make that using, thinking about families who may be first connecting with um, the healthcare system and the emergency department, how do we build an anxiety tool that might help that transition? And from a, a study that Dr. Newton, um, one of our, our collaborators and, and one of the other pri principal investigators on our project um, that she conducted, you know, the, the, there's an increase in um, the number of youth in that age group who are who are visiting um, emergency departments for that reason. So I think um, the, the need for that for developing other kinds of tools is is pretty clear. So we've talked a little bit about sort of some of the system and access things. One of the things, one of the growing areas of research right now is trying to have a better understanding of what do youth actually prefer themselves? How do they prefer to have information given to them? And how do they prefer to have access? Um, from, you know, 1996, that seems really outdated. There hasn't been a lot of sort of uh, up-to-date data on this sort of issue of youth preferences, but um, Bradley and colleagues reported that youth who are looking for treatment preferences in terms of depression listed talk therapy with a family physician, a psychiatrist, and psychologist over, over medication. So I think those are really important things to keep in mind um, when we think about anxiety. Um, and I think it's also really important that we know that youth are we know that youth are looking um, they're they're looking online and when you whenever you look at the Yahoo studies about who's accessing what and where people are going, we know that um, we know that people are still going to the traditional sort of WebMD, doing Google searches, checking with Wikipedia, um, and we know that they're, they're trying to find information, but it's not always good information. And so one of the things that we wanted to do with our project is really 
focus on providing information that's based on on scientific evidence and that's really coming that's been really vetted through you know qualified healthcare professionals who understand not just that we need to give youth information but that there's a clinical therapeutic message that needs to be delivered and there's some strategies for doing that we that the research has shown us are going to be more effective in helping youth in the long term there was one systematic review that was done a couple of years ago that looked at um, youth's perceptions of barriers to help seeking and I thought it was kind of an interesting point to make out here that from a youth's perspective some of the things that are they see as barriers are really stigma and embarrassment around the fact that they're dealing with a mental health issue um, difficulty for youth to recognizing their own problems or their their own symptoms and what those symptoms mean so really the tapping into that sort of poor, poor mental health literacy component um, and also really a preference for self-reliance so youth wanting to sort of do it themselves and I can take care of this myself and I can handle it myself and so those those are some of the barriers that youth experience in trying to access services from the kind of the, the traditional sort of healthcare system that we have now. And then in terms of, and Doug's going to do a little audience poll here too, but in terms of sort of our current delivery system, um, we also have some challenges. So youth have some barriers and challenges and, and so do um, so does the system that we work in and I think I just sort of there's four sort of listed here and maybe there's some that aren't on the list that uh, we could talk about a little later but I think um, these seem to come up as as sort of current issues with how do we access help access youth to access the services and resources that, that they need to be able to um, to be able to, to to work with their problems. So that sort of silo style service where there's not a lot of connection between different service sectors. So we see a lot of repetition, um, insufficient workforce. Maybe we just need to hire more so social workers and psychologists and that would and put them in the school system or give them give them more access. Maybe it's issues related to location. You know, I live in Nova Scotia. We have a, a significant rural population who often don't have um, trained uh, you know, trained psychologists or trained social workers in their community, they might have a community health nurse. So maybe location and being able to access things at a distance is really um, one of our bigger challenges. Or maybe it's just funding, maybe we just need to look more at um, increasing the money that's available to provide those services. So yeah, Doug, if you don't mind, let's do a little audience poll and just see what uh, what our group thinks is the really the most urgent challenge to our system in Canada right now. All right, so the, the poll, the next poll is up on the screen. So as Dr. Wozni said, it's the question is what system challenge is the most urgent in Canada? And uh, and while we're waiting for people to um, to make their selections, uh, we did have one question come in. This is a, should be an easy one. Uh, one of your slides earlier at the very near the very beginning, you had a number of disorders, ADHD, ODD, and one was CD. And someone has asked, what is CD? CD. I believe it was the third bar from the left on one CD of CD refers to conduct disorder. Conduct disorder. All right. Yes. There you go. <laughs> yeah, so that, and so that's also an opportunity for me to remind people to you know, type in your questions as you think of them. We'll, we'll, uh, we'll be more than happy to answer them and add them to the discussion. So. And if you did, uh, if you are selecting, uh, there's only a few of you that have selected other challenges uh, not listed uh, so far. If if you if you want, feel free to type in what those other challenges might be that you're thinking of. Just type those into the question box, and maybe we can uh, add those to the uh, to the discussion as well. All right. Yeah, that would be great. That off, and it looks like uh, most people think the. Silo style uh, service uh, delivery is the biggest problem and lack of funding is the second problem. Shortage of care providers followed by location of uh, services and slash travel. Uh, only a few selected other challenges and no one has uh, typed in what those other challenges might be. But, right, so back over to you. Right. And I think that that really is that's echoed in a lot of the I spend a lot of time with the teen mental health nurses here in the high schools and we talk a lot about that service fragmentation and not um, sort of streamlining the process and helping people to be able to access services more efficiently and more effectively. So I don't think that's, um, I'm not really all that surprised. Um, one of the neat things that I'll show you because the next sort of step is we're going to take a look through our wired and you'll see how how that system is actually able to help us make some connections between um, primary care and youth and their families and um, and sort of try as, as a way as a portal to sort of be able to, to bring those those services together so that'll be our next that'll be sort of our next step 
So really just to sum up that first sort of section where we just talked a little bit about how do we meet and connect with youth, how do we improve access and services and connect providers with youth, really the every door is the right door policy from the Mental Health Commission's initiative. We want to be able to develop innovative care models that are going to help us um, provide alternative ways for youth who are currently undertreated and, and often untreated or undertreated for anxiety. Give them um, extra extra um, support and help them connect in ways that are meaningful to them and that are going to engage them in the process um, because we know that these, these are sort of long-term, not sort of hit and miss um, initiatives. So I don't know if there's any questions about related to that first whole sort of chunk related to access or um, services and if not we can sort of keep going and we can uh, walk through some of the functions and featuresnalities of our actual program. One person, there were a couple of uh, comments came in re related to the multiple choice question about what they thought the other challenges might be. So maybe I'll share a couple of yeah, those. Yeah, neat. Uh, one person said they believe the greatest issue is the lack of ac accessibility in mental health services or parity for psychologists with physicians. Okay. What's uh, the other one too? Uh, there's another one that said uh, the, the, the ish, issue was related to a lack of youth-centered or youth-friendly services. So maybe access to services, but just not services that are youth-friendly. Yeah. Um, I, guess, I guess we'll speak to the first one sort of in terms of parity between psychologists and doctors, was it again? Yeah, that's essentially. Uh, yeah, I think they're essentially saying that uh, there's, a, there's not parity between access to psychologists versus access to physicians. Right. And I think one of the other challenges that go along with that is that, you know, a primary care physician might not have that sort of specialized mental health care training. Um, and and maybe they do. And maybe they maybe with these kinds of extra tools and resources, they might be able to provide that kind of care. Um, I'm not sure if there was any other details to that that they wanted to sort of bring up. But well, I think it's Patrick. McGraw here, and I think one of the issues is is that uh, psychology services are typically not uh, funded through the uh, uh, provincial health uh, insurance. Um, they are funded in institutions such as hospitals, um, but they're n not very frequent. And uh, the chances of the provincial governments uh, allowing another care provider to um, be uh, uh, into the system in Canada, they're doesn't seem to be much appetite for that, although it has been done in Australia where there is uh, more access to uh, uh, by uh, to, to psychologists through their uh, um, their health care uh, insurance. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it certainly is true that there is a very differential aspect. And, if, yeah, and uh, I guess if we do answer your question and we don't quite quite grasp what you what the intent of your question is please just feel free to put a, a follow-up question in there and we'll try to add that but I, I, I think that's uh, what dr. McGrath has just said is uh, is more what uh, is is what the is answering the question that was asked I, I think that's the sense I got yeah. yeah and if I just could speak to the the youth friendly question I was just gonna say I think that's really one of the big challenges that we're seeing not just in terms of like things online anxiety tools but just resources in general for youth um, because youth come with so many different interests and ideas and you know particularly with this population different reading levels different attention levels different um, other disorders and things that they're working through it's difficult to sort of build a one-size-fits-all so I think um, you know what we're trying to think about is building these customized and personalized tools that are going to let us um, be able to make these more youth friendly and more um, more engaging and more connected to the things that they're actually dealing with in life and language that they can they can understand and we'll talk a little bit about that when I walk you through the site about reducing medical jargon and things like that but I, I definitely agree that trying to move towards youth friendly um, being able to maintain a ther the therapeutic message but also sort of tap into those sort of um, the interests and the things that are going to help motivate youth um, to, to participate in these kinds of programs is really really important and we don't have a, a, as, as much research as you would think about how we though how youth actually what they actually think and what their preferences are for those kinds of resources so um, I think that's a really good point yeah. we did have a, a couple questions uh, related to the silo style service delivery someone someone asked what was from the survey what was the most uh, urgent system challenge and, and our little survey here showed it was the silo style service delivery and someone else asked what we right. meant by silo style really separated so that you know you have 
primary care doing one thing, you have the school doing another thing, you have um, everybody sort of in their own their own space. There's not a lot of crossover and a lot of not a lot, a lot of connection and coordination and sort of wraparound services of care. Things are not coordinated across across you know your school, your social worker, what you're doing at home, what your family's doing. Um, so we don't have a, a broader picture of how how youth's needs are being met from from different from different groups within the community. Yeah, and I think there, that's something that at, at CAFC. The other thing is that there's no. Go ahead, Pat. Sorry, the other thing is there's no communication often between. So the mental, a common complaint from my colleagues who are in primary care is, is it's very difficult to get um, somebody uh, seen in, in specialist care, but and then the second thing is that they never find out what happened to them. Mm -hmm. um, so I think there's, there's a communication problem and there's a lack of coordination. Yeah, and I was just I was just going to comment that in our work at, at CAFC, looking across the the country and working on projects across the continuum of care, from acute care to home care to and everything in between, I think we see that it's we see this more I think with these services that are less acute because you start getting into that those cross sectoral issues as Dr. Wozni was suggesting. You get the education system and the social services system and the healthcare system, and they and they're all sort of they're 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 all in silos, not communicating, not connected. Funding issues, jurisdictional issues, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and it, with these, especially with mental health, I think we see it's, it's probably worse than than a lot of other uh, health-related issues. Uh, the next, uh, someone is asking if you can show the uh, ED use statistics slide again, as well as the uh, slide showing self-management resources. And and I'm not sure if, if you want to show that now or if we want to just make that available afterwards. We will be making yeah. slides available afterwards. But uh, yeah, let's do. I think that would be good. Yeah. Uh, and someone else just made another final comment saying that youth seem to seek apps and go online for information and she's asking what's being created to address this. So I think that might lead nicely to the next portion of your presentation because that's exactly what you're about to talk about, I think. Isn't it? Yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> and it's true and that's one of the things that we need to, um, I guess that was really our challenge as a research team. I mean, I think we need to think about, you know, when you have um, the healthcare marketplace where people are building apps and tools and um, being able to sell them they're gener they're using and motivated by different by different uh, by different goals but for us really what we wanted to do was how do we pull together what we know about about best practice about clinical working with youth who have are dealing with anxiety and the sort of the, the technology tools that we have available to us particularly at our research center um, to really build um, a beta version of, of a tool that we can start testing and um, I know that we're up you know a lot of times when you build these tools you're up against you know what what people have spent many many hundreds of thousands of dollars in, in development time to build and are able to roll out um, quickly into iTunes or um, onto their website but I think what we really our challenge was really trying to focus on the population that we wanted to work with and how do we use and I'm going to talk a little bit about how Wired which is the name that we've used for the pro the program and Iris, which is really the platform or the engine that allows us to deliver Wired as a customized and personalized experience for youth. Um, how do we take those two things and work them together so that we can we can help um, create something that's not just your standard informational website, but where youth can actually interact with their, with information about themselves and and work through. We have eight direct self-directed sessions where they work through interactive activities and we embed some multimedia tools to help um, move away from that sort of workbook model and try to make put it online and make those tools more accessible and um, build a beta version that we can build from and improve on in the future. That's really um, that's really our goal. Um, and I think like we just sort of talked, we've been talking a little bit about earlier too that just it's really important to understand that, that the transition from sort of traditional models to, to e-health interventions, it's already happening in, in many, many places. Um, and so, you know, for some people this is an issue of how do we sort of incorporate these online tools with traditional um, healthcare delivery or do we do we make them sort of their own, do we isolate them and create our own e-health interventions that sort of operate on their own self-directed, self-paced. Um, but what we do know is these kinds of tools have really risen in popularity over the last five years. Um, we're starting to see evidence that they can be as effective as non-web-based interventions in particular areas, things like with um, cognitive behavior therapy. We see a lot of cognitive behavior therapy tools, computer-based tools that are coming um, coming out. 
Um, we do know that these kinds of interventions have a role to play in helping to reduce, like we talk, already talked about, emergency department visits, hospitalizations. And we know, as we talked about with youth, one of those barriers being, you know, stigma and wanting to be sort of more self-reliant. We know that um, building these online tools might help us tap into and leverage some of those things that are going to help um, you find these tools more convenient, easy to use, um, and can also help them maintain their anonymity and privacy. Um, so here's another little audience poll for us. Um, a caution: you're entering your your comfort zone. Um, I'm always sort of really interested to know, you know, what where people are in terms of how comfortable they are with thinking about youth having access to these mental health services online. So Doug, if you wanna if you wanna do a little poll with our audience, I think it might be interesting to see what our how our group is feeling about it. All right, this will be interesting. Yeah. The, so the question is, what is your current comfort level with having youth access mental health services online? And I know uh, just glancing through the audience list, we had some uh, people from another online mental health service uh, in the audience. So it'll be interesting if uh, they have any comments about this as well. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's different when you think about the, the different comfort levels between youth being comfortable, but also clinicians being comfortable, with also parents being comfortable. Um, you know, the world's colliding where we're now seeing so many more things online. Um, having an idea of you know how many people are really um, convinced that this is the way to go or um, we still need work to do to uh, to help them come on on side and, and work to that direction um, it's always really interesting to see what the what groups where groups fall yeah, well from this audience uh, the most uh, common answer 45% of the audience says quite comfortable followed by completely comfortable oh no sorry followed by very comfortable completely comfortable, barely comfortable, and uncomfortable. So the middle of the road is the most popular here. Yeah, and I mean, I think that's good. And I think one of the things moving forward that's really important as we look at these tools and we build them and we test them and we work with youth and, and see how how they're how they're working is understanding that there's going to be a lot of sort of negotiating that has to happen to um, make sure we answer all those questions that people have about whether it whether it works, why it works, ethical issues, and we're going to talk a little bit about that later. But let's start talking a little bit about what our tool is um, and what Iris what Iris does and what Wired does. So if you think about Wired, really there's two components to it. One is, like I said, the engine, which is IRIS. It's the Intelligent Research and Intervention Software. And what IRIS does and what IRIS allows us to do is allows us to customize um, our user interface. It allows us to integrate media so we can use video, audio, text, graphics. We can embed animations. It also has a system on the back end that allows us to do automated letter generation or email reminders. So we can send, great job, you finished uh, You finished this session, like here's something to remember for the next session. Or um, we can send reminders to parents that said your child just finished working a module on this. Here's some tips that relate to that topic. Here's some things you might want to you might want to avoid or might want to keep in mind as you're supporting them. And um, it allows us to sort of automatically have that system running in the back end. It also gives us the ability to sort of look at and report on how youth are using the program. What kind of what kind of um, components of the program are, is our individual youth using and work and accessing and working through, and then also patterns of usage. So it, it allows us to look at, um, you know, were there a, whole, a significant number of youth who didn't complete a certain tryout page or didn't watch one of the educational videos or didn't um, didn't work through any of the practice examples. It lets us have a much better understanding of how youth are actually interacting with um, and using the, the program. Um, one of the great and important things about Iris is that it allows us to tailor our workflow. So instead of sort of opening up a website where youth have access to all kinds of content and that can sort of bog down their process in, of learning, um, Iris allows us to tailor workflow to individual um, and hide show content based on different things. So, for example, if we knew that there was a youth that was struggling with alcohol um, and drug abuse, they might be given access to modules and sections that that deal with that specifically. Somebody who isn't struggling with that, you might want you might not want to give them access to that right now, and that that content can be can be hidden from them um, and opened at a later date or triggered by by an answer that they make later on in the uh, in the program. It also lets us do things like um, um, personalize the content so and we're going to see in a couple of examples where some of the graphic novel type comic strip images that we use we can we can input ones that relate more to specific things that a youth is involved in if they're really involved in sports we might use some sports examples for our vignettes and our and our stories and if they're really involved in something else 
we can input um, different kind of workflows. So we're able to, Iris allows us to have that, the clinical algorithms in the background that can help us really pull out a lot of the content that, you, that, that youth might not really need at the moment or, um, and really sort of tailor and personalize it to their specific needs. Um, we also, Iris also allows us to have access to discussion boards. Um, you can have an email, you can have an ask the expert option. Um, those can be turned off and on. Um, and really it's an accessible, it's a way for us to really to provide scalable, scalable support at a distance. So we can have a lot of people using Iris at one time as opposed to just one um, sort of website that people are coming to look at. And on the research clinical side for us as we're a research team and we're, we're looking to pilot this in the fall, um, what, one of the things that's really great for us is it's, it gives us a way to sort of track um, changes in mood. We're dealing with an at-risk population. We want to be able to help assess whether Wired is the place where they need to be or maybe they need to have, you know, more um, a different kind of intervention to really meet the need at, that they have at the level that they're at. But that's really, if you think about Iris as the engine, those are the, all of the functionality that Iris allows us, allows us to have. And right now, Iris is running on a number of different projects, five different languages. It's work, and, um, iterations of Iris, not for the anxiety project, but for other um, projects are operating in Finland and Spain and Canada and really in 14 different projects. So Iris itself is, is relatively new, but it's being used as a platform to really deliver these kind of behavioral intervention and programs. And the wired side of it, which is really the anxiety tool that we want to um, that we that we want to work with youth on, is really built around sort of eight core modules that are delivered in kind of a cognitive behavior therapy model. And we we targeted the content to be at about a grade six literacy level. Um, so the component, and we're going to in a, one second, I'm going to sort of walk you through some of the slides. So you can actually take a little a closer look um, at what it looks like. But basically, there's there's an intake module that takes in a lot of information from youth that they can report about the problems that they're experiencing and a little bit about their life and we use that information to filter out and, and, and develop that, the, the system uses that information to develop that workflow and to, to set the triggers and hide flow of all the content. We want them to be able to track and record their progress through the treatment so there's a space for that. We always do a mood check-in and a check-out at each session each session just to make sure that we, like I said, we're, we're sort of targeting the right level of anxiety and we, we want to make sure that if they need additional services, they're able to access them um, elsewhere. And we also are building a follow-up module for three months after they've actually finished it just to sort of look back and see um, about lasting effects and any issues that came up after they, they completed their, their sessions. And Wired is really about a lot of, is really about a lot of things. It's, we wanted to reduce the sort of text load, the cognitive load of reading through a lot of text, so we've incorporated some video, um, broken the resources into sort of smaller chunks, incorporated a lot of self-assessment activities, and activities to teach them about anxiety sensitivity, how to identify their anxious thoughts, they go through a lot of worked examples related to realistic thinking, um, we go through some relaxation skills training with them, and then later on we're going to be, we're developing the modules that relate to helping them develop a hierarchy of feared situations and the steps to help them um, engage in exposure to those feared situations. Um, we try to incorporate modeling by using videos of others who have confronted feared situations and also little animations that sort of give them a model for what it might look like to actually think through a visualization activity, for example. And we also do skills for relapse prevention. So a couple of the things that um, this is sort of just like the, the sort of the main page, what it, what it looks like sort of in their, their home space, their own workspace. Um, one of the things that's really important about what we're doing with Iris is privacy and security is obviously really important to youth. So there, it's a login password protected program. So this is youth have their own space um, that they that they can work in and there's a timeout, so if they were working on their computer at home and they had to do something else and they were worried that their little brother or somebody might come and see what they were working on, there's actually a timeout set that times out and saves everything that the youth were working on. Um, we are currently going through the privacy impact assessment approval process here to make sure that we meet all of the provincial and federal regulations for um, private healthcare information. Um, all of the features available to youth can be turned off and on by the researchers. So for example, if we didn't want them to have access to the access, the expert or the discussion board, those features can be turned off without a problem. Um, and the program can be used with or without coaching. So 
Um, really, we just want to make sure we just we wanted to build a system that was really private and that youth could feel like it was their own space to work through things, and that it was secure. And um, and so we're working to that end for sure. Um, so as you can see along the top here, that's their home. This is where they access their se sessions, their workbench. We're going to take a look at that a little later. But that workbench is where they're able to st store and practice all of the practice activities that we suggest they can try. And they get to choose which ones they want to work on. They can have email messages sent. We saw the little... Um, the little email message here on the last side, just welcome to Wired. You can have this set to send messages to them. They're also able to have email functionality if you want them to be able to access a coach or send emails from their system to something else. The file section is really a little library where we keep audio and media files if they want to go back and review them or download them or print them. Um, and like I said, community is really the spot where they go to be able to access those discussion boards and ask the expert options. This is just a little snapshot of what the Mood Check-In does. Um, we're using Stan Kutcher's um, assessment tool here for sort of trying to get an idea um, on, a, on a weekly basis um, when they do their Mood Check-On. Just, just a quick overview of how, the, how their week has been at school, at home with friends. and. Um, we have a system set up that they can, um, the risk management flags are sort of, are, are triggered for our, the clinicians who are, who are overviewing the project so they know if you say that things are much worse than usual, maybe we need to do a follow-up with them and make sure that things are okay or maybe they need to be given, we give them a list of services if they need to go to the emergency department or call 911. Some of those risk management things are built into the system. But I think what's really important too about the mood check-in is it really is, um, sort of that scaffolding and, and modeling self-monitoring skills and because they get used to doing it at every module in every module it's sort of a, a kind of a consistent flow for each of their sessions so I, I we were going to show a video but oops but um, the, the audio was sort of an issue and the files really large but uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna work with Mandy our, our to actually put it up alongside the presentation when we're, we're finished here today but um, youth are able to go through and see um, some short videos this one's a two minute and 30 minute two minute and 30 second video on anxiety what's great about it is that um, what would take them 20 pages of content to read we're able to sort of animate and put in some graphs and really visually explain and clarify those difficult um, those difficult sort of terms and ideas in a way that's just much more accessible to them and we're able in Iris to embed video we're also able to link to outside resources so if there were things on YouTube that we wanted to incorporate we're able to do that from within our system um, and just using visual media to help explain concepts is really important we do do a, it's like we do a little mood check-in we always do a little mood check out at the end it's also just sort of self-monitoring modeling and, and helping us for our, our risk management follow-up as well um, I think one of the things that we really try to do with uh, with the, with our with our tool is really keep it very simple. Um, we do provide in that file section extra information that they can go to. We try to provide sort of a basic overview of things and then allow them to explore deeper and deeper as they need to, but without sort of giving them too much information at the beginning. Um, we try to do a lot of worked examples. Um, simple graphic reminders like we see on this page just to sort of illustrate and provide a, a more than just a text-based way to sort of understand and clarify their understand new understandings we we worked with a comic book artist in Canada that works on a couple of famous comics Adventure Time and Bravest Warrior and uh, he built us a, a series of panels and, and illustrations that we've used throughout our, our site to sort of help us capture vignettes or experiences from these are taken these ones are taken from a point of view so you sort of put yourself in the place of the person that's that's in the picture um, and in that experience and we use them to to sort of hide show examples to youth and customize their content so that they get examples of things that are more relevant to them and we also do some, he also constructed for us several long-term panels that allow us to do really short 30 second to 50 second um, animations. And this one is an animation that does a visualization technique uh, strategy and it shows um, the way that a youth would walk through a visualization activity um, and how it can, and the thoughts and the ideas that they think about in order to help them reduce their, their anxiety um, and breathe and be able to come back to um, the situation that they're in and have a lower level of anxiety and so those those these short animations really require a lot less time to convey those kinds of concepts for you than having them be able to see a modeled example um, is often 
much easier for them to then go try out on their own. Um, we do have image mapping. Um, this was sort of the the, the the beta beta version, you'll see the, the image mapping buttons weren't that great, but they're working on that now. But really what we want to do is be able to let youth explore um, concepts and spaces and content so that they don't have to get everything all at once. They can go and sort of see what's most relevant to them. We can pipe in, you know, aspects of their own personal history with anxiety where, for example, on the, on the body map, um, we might just only pipe in the ones that they identified as being thing, areas of their body that they really experience symptoms of anxiety. So we can kind of hide show or, or provide more and allow them to explore, um, but that those functionality is also there in our system. So one of you know at sort of the core sections of every module, they do a check-in. They work on a discover section that you see here, that, which is where they're doing some sort of some psychoeducational learning and some they seeing some practice examples and some worked examples. Then they do a little checkout, a mood checkout, and then they sort of work on sort of trying to apply concept that they learn in the module and also trying to sort of set them up for the content that they're going to be looking at in the, in the following module. And we try to give them choices so that they're not forced to pick one. Um, being able to have those opportunities to make choices um, gives them a sense of moral ownership and sort of being able to be self-directed. And we want them to, these are really, the trial pages are really about skill development and helping them to scaffold that process towards exposure activities so that as they work through the trial pages, through, they don't, they don't might not know it at module one, but each of those components is really helping to build them towards modules six, seven, and eight, where they're working on um, actually planning for and um, working through those exposure activities. And I, I just made. I just wanted to pull, draw attention here that we have a create new and update with the trial pages. One thing that's really nice is we know it's not. We don't want you to sort of think of these as one-shot homework assignments. They're really about a workspace for them in their workbench tool space that they can go back to, and they're always able to create new ones. So if they need to go back, and we know with cognitive behavior therapy, there needs to be a lot of practice of those skills before you can sort of move to to a higher level of anxiety or a different kind of exposure. So we want them to have lots of opportunity to practice, and Iris allows them to create those new practice examples and practice worksheets and save them and see their progress over time and be able to go back and review which ones worked, which ones didn't, and or to be able to update one that they, they've already started working on. So it gives them more choice and ownership, but also allows them to sort of see that um, some there's going to be areas where they're going to need to work a little bit harder and work through maybe multiple examples of something and give something multiple try before they move to the next step. And Iris is, it, we can build it so that Iris is, can accommodate those changes as well and save their work automatically. And really that's just what so that's just what their little tryout page they would have all their sessions and all of their trio page and all that support is automated and like I mentioned earlier what's nice is we can send a little trigger and a little encouragement or a little great job celebration certificate or something even um, at the end of those modules just to say great work and provide a lot of positive um, positive reinforcement for the work that they're doing. So I don't know if there's any questions about that sort of sort of the overview of wired um, as a tool at this point. Uh, we did have uh, a few questions come in. Sure. Um, so the first one is, uh, this was with uh, going back to the, uh, the last poll that we did. And yep. I just wanted to make a comment. She said she, uh, she indicated that she was very comfortable with youth accessing mental health services online, but she wanted to point out that uh, she would want those online services to provide the youth with information for accessing a real live provider in their community. That's the, the sort of the, the caveat. That right. They're very comfortable. So. Yeah, I like that. Yeah. And I mean, th I think that's important that those are some of the, the issues. Do we think of the, uh, you know, do we think of these sort of online resources as as portals or hubs to access, you know, face to face resources. Do we find do we think of them as a place where youth can access peer support and find some general information? But again, that's going to connect them with um, healthcare services that are provided in their communities um, through their the healthcare system. Or ca do we think about these services as being something that could be run by a healthcare service provider or by, you know, a general practitioner could use something like this in conjunction with youth that they're already seeing. So some of those issues of like, what's the role of the online environment? Is it to sort of connect with and then filter and connect youth to face-to-face um, -face providers, or is it could we can we think of the online space as actually being its own um, its own therapeutic space? And what are what are some of the challenges if we move to that? And I appreciate that that caveat there from that participant. That's um, that's very important. Uh, the next question is asking is. 
and it's sort of because this is study uh, right now. It's not it's not you know open yeah. for for use uh, you know in the wild so to speak. Uh, yeah. One person just asked, when are you hoping to have this launched? Um, well, we're, right now we've just sort of gone, we're going through usability in sessions one to four, and I'm just going to skip ahead for one second. So one thing I would say is that if there's any clinicians that, that are participating on in the audience that would be interested in actually going through the full four sessions and taking a closer look and seeing the videos and watching all of the animations and really providing feedback, we, we would love to be able to connect with some clinicians to actually, our usability study for the first four modules is happening right now mm-hmm. over the summer, and um, the next four modules probably in the next probably starting sometime in August finishing up in September um, but yeah we would I would love if there's anybody in, and I'll leave this slide up at the end too um, who would be interested we'd like to sort of launch in January in uh, in the in the ERs that we're participating with um, that's sort of our goal but yeah right now we're sort of in the middle of our usability testing right. someone from the IWK says yes you would like to uh, see it she's on the fourth floor <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Um, uh, so the, the the next question is about is again about accessing the tool, and and this may apply. Maybe you can think forward for when it is uh, is released yep. and, and being used. The question is: Is access restricted? Does it need to be initiated by a clinician? Does a re- and does a report or will a report go back to the clinician? Right. Right now, it is. It is. You don't, You can't just sort of go and self sign up for the study. Um, the clinician meets originally in the, in terms of the study. They're actually meeting with the clinician over the phone first, to just to do some preliminary assessments to make sure that we're the right fit. Um, and then at that point, the clinician will will set them up with a login and um, and a password, a temporary password that they can then go into the site and have that their own space set up. And you do keep a record of uh, the clinician does keep a record of what. Uh, what the, what the youth have been doing in there, and I mean, I think it's also important to remember that, you know, maybe not right now, but Iris is in, on its way to being um, HL7 compliant, which means that interop, inopter, inoperability with uh, with other um, with other um, technologies in terms of sort of the uh, electronic health record. So you know, we're working towards having Iris sort of be part of that. So I think there's, you know, right now you have, you can't just sort of log in and do it, but I think eventually we're, we're hoping to be able to uh, connect these with other systems within the hospital and within the healthcare system. Uh, the next, uh, someone else had a comment, uh, they're from BC and they, they're just wondering if you're aware of a new free app from Anxiety BC called MindShift and it's available in iTunes and on the Google Play Store and apparently it's a CBT based self-help uh, tool for anxious youth. Yes, I have and actually Anxiety BC has been great. They've actually let us, um, for our pilot test, just use the YouTube videos for us to get some usability feedback about the YouTube videos on their um, Anxiety BC website. Um, so yeah, I have taken a look at it and it's great. Uh, the next question is asking, can you say a little more about the coaching uh, aspect and how that works? Sure. Um, we haven't really um, sort of settled the extent to which we think the youth are going to interact with coaches in our system. Um, Dr. McGrath has um, significant experience working with the Strongest Families Institute, which is a nonprofit here that works to deliver um, telehealth to families with children who have behavioral difficulties. And they have a lot of experience um, and success with having families paired up with a, a coach on the phone to sort of work through CBT um, skills and activities um, lessons and activities. And so one of the things when we built Iris, we, we talked a little bit about um, where, do, how much do we, and do we incorporate a coaching component to it, and should we have a coaching component? I mean, I think it's a little preliminary right now in terms of our, we're, we're just sort of de- designing and developing it, and we're not really sure what the best implementation look would be, but what you could do with it is have a coach that would be in contact with youth, you know, maybe at the end of every module, or at the end of three modules, and then at the, at the end, um, Initially, for the study, they're going to have contact with a coach at the beginning or a, a clinician, um, you know, a certified clinician at the beginning, and, and then sort of monitoring those risk management issues, but not really to sort of delve too much into the activities and the things that the youth are working on. But that is that is an option that could be that could be explored at another time. All right. 
so again, another, another question that you, you may have already answered this, but I'll ask it anyways. Um, sure. She's uh, asking, they would love to know who can use it and who can access it. Again, it's still in, stu- in sort of the study phase right now, but and she's also asking if there's a cost associated or will there be a cost? Maybe you can even go so far as to predict whether there would be a, ever be any cost associated with using it and if the videos are available to anyone. Yeah, um, I mean, I think, right, like I said, right now we're in terms of the usability. So if there's really anybody that's that would be interested in doing the, the our usability sessions, I would really encourage you. Hillary would love to sort of book you in and talk to you a little bit more about what is involved, um, and you will be able to sort of get a full overview. In terms of like mass making it available to everybody, um, we're definitely a little ways off. Like I said, we're not even hoping to sort of launch our pilot RCT in until probably November, December, January of 2014. Um, but if people want to sort of take a look through or would like to look at some of the resources, I'm happy to, to sort of work through them. I don't think we're, we're going to be sort of posting things on YouTube at this point. Like even the videos and things are sort of a scratch audio on top. We haven't finalized having youth do the audio for, for our videos and things. We're kind of just in that development phase. But um, eventually, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunities and places where this this could be used and helpful. And I don't I don't think there's a cost associated with it. Obviously, just the development costs, we, that we really haven't gotten that far in terms of uh, where we're going to take it after that. The next question is asking uh, if you can uh, re- uh, repost the eight sessions again, just so she could see what those were. Uh, and she goes on to ask if you can tell her if this was based on an adult online tool for anxiety, and if it wasn't, have you do you have any plans to create one that is similar for adults? Um, no, I think we sort of took Strongest Families Institute that I mentioned earlier. They have been running an, a number of programs um, for, for youth with behavior that uses the CBT components. So we sort of took some of them as a model. We didn't, there was no one particular adult anxiety program. I think a lot of the sort of cognitive behavior therapy tools have very similar approaches and um, constructs. We sort of tried to take the best of what was there and what the research had shown us and what was going to most easily be adaptable to what Iris has. Because Iris, unlike a website, and you'll notice it when you looked at it, you were like, man, I've seen better looking websites than that. But Iris itself is really in development and has some certain programming things that we've had to build and and will need to continue to build to give it the same kind of functionality and ease of use that you'd find with um, with sort of any kind of off-the-shelf web development tool. So um, in terms of we haven't thought about an, one for adults. I'm, I think there are probably a couple out there. There are, there are definitely tools for youth um, related to anxiety. It's just I don't think they have it in sort of the structured way that we are using it with all of those sort of um, personalized and customized workflows. I think that's what makes us a little bit different from some of the other um, tools that are out there. But um, yeah, so those, is this the site? I, I don't know, you might want to check, Doug, if this was the, the the slide that she was interested in looking at. And again, as I mentioned before, we will be posting these slides up on the Knowledge Exchange Network on that pa- page I showed you uh, previously. And, and you'll also get an automatic notification from the system with the link directly to that page once the video is available as well. So so you can, uh, you can always go and see these later if you haven't had a chance to Jot down all yeah, the and I'm happy to. Um, I'm ha- I'll give you. I'm happy for people to actually email me if there's if the questions or want to see something or. Yep, yeah, I can do that as well. Uh, the next question is asking: Is uh, is Iris an independent supplier of the software engine, and do they also have? Do they also do the adaptations required for Wired? And can you share what the uh, what the costs involved in that are? I don't know if Pat, are you still there? Um, I thought Pat might still be there. Um, the the IP for Iris is actually owned by Pat. He's been building, Iris has been in development and actually different research projects have contributed to its development over time. It's really, I think, a year and a half, two years old. Um, it started out as a, they needed to build a tool that would allow, um, they built a project with the University of um, Finland and Turku, Finland, to deliver um, a program for parents who have children with behavior difficulties. And so they started with a very sort of basic uh, a basic program. And then over time, all of the different research projects for chronic pain and abdominal pain and parent-adolescent conflict, different projects that have had re- development money have put money into building IRIS um, putting Iris together. Um, this winter, Iris was, was awarded an Innovacore grant um, through, the Depart- through the Nova Scotia government, um, and that's allowing us to do some usability testing and sort of look at, like, sort of early stage commercialization, like how can we move Iris um, 
because we have so much interested in it and it can fit into so many different kinds of areas how can we how can we move that um, that platform itself um, and spin that off as its own its own private its own private uh, company and its own private um, space but for now the IP is owned by Pat all right uh, I'm not sure how many more questions you want to take now. Is there much? Do you have much more you want to present? Or we do have. I know. I really, really, just a couple, just two quick things I wanted to just say. I think in terms of coming out of our building this tool, um, you know, a bad website is like a grumpy salesperson, and that's very true. Um, you don't want to build these sites and these online tools and just run into one of two problems where you have a great site and nobody uses it or you have you know a terrible people are flocking to something that's really not if they love it but it's really not doing what what we know it by for in terms of research about what's going to really help youth um, improve these, these these in these areas so you need to find the balance in between and I think that's what we're trying to do with our usability study and really I guess just sort of the, the sort of question uh, the questions that I have working on the project as we move forward through usability and the risks and rewards of building these kinds of online tools for youth is there's so much more that we need to learn about how to use these tools um, not just a lot of studies just care about whether they work so do anxiety scores go down do depression scores go down but we need to do a lot more work about understanding why these tools work and why is understanding what are the moderators you know what's what's is it videos is it is it less pages is it more pages is it color graphics is it them being able to have an avatar trying to understand what is it about the feet of the features and functionalities of the systems that are actually explaining more or less of the gains that we're seeing I think also one of the things that's coming out of usability is where do these tools fit in sort of traditional models fully online like that participant was talking about that the great question about sort of um, you know is it for accessing, you know, somebody in their community face to face? Can we use them concurrently? Can they? Can they? Or should they be? Can they? And should they be used in isolation? And then I think really the issue of, you know, there's so much freeware, there's so much open source. Um, people can access apps for 99 cents. There's really an entire health marketplace out there, and it's how do we? Um, make sure that, the, that there's tools that are available and the tools that are being used are really backed up by research and that really are ch achieving clinical outcomes and not just sort of I like it a Facebook thumbs up or you know four stars out of five um, better understanding like what what people are actually experiencing and what how are we actually translating all of this all of these technology tools into really improved lives and outcomes for for youth and I think a big thing in terms of the, of the questions that we asked today about the polling questions relate really to those issues of ethics and privacy and the level of clinician contact and those are things that I think we need to have ongoing discussions about as we as these tools proliferate and we see them popping up all over the place and um, as we move to, to building these kind of tools those are going to be um, really key things for us to think about moving forward so that was really all I wanted to, to say about that stuff I don't know if there's any more questions or oh yes absolutely that's a I okay. was just I was just wondering how we could balance the rest of the presentation with this increasingly growing list of questions that we have oh no worries that's all it that was sort of the little wrap-up that was just a sort of takeaway from where we are right now with our usability sessions and, and a number of questions are related to connecting and being part of pilots and looking for more information about iris uh, for example okay. and I'm assuming uh, they can anyone who wants any information can contact Hillary at the address here and she can forward them on to the appropriate people. I think that would be perfect all right so we'll leave that slide up there for now so people have that information sure so, so anyone who's asking those questions about connecting with this team about anything that's been presented contact Hillary deluge her with email and she'll uh, take care of you yep and if people are interested in, in iris I'll and go through Hillary and I can like you know let you know about that and some of the other projects that are working and absolutely get the information All right. uh, so the next question is uh, someone asked what happens if a child appears to be at risk of harming themselves does a live person reach out and intervene in any, in any way right so the system right now two things happen when when a youth has flagged something like um, we ask a question you know have you thought about have you made a plan or, or attempted or thought about um, harming yourself and if they flick yes two things happen one is immediately the clinician is flagged and sent an email that says there's something serious happening the second thing that happens is the youth actually a pop-up window comes up on the system and, and lets them know that a coach is going to be following up with them um, the third thing that happens is there's a space for them to add some details and to write in what's going on if they want. 
um, so that the clinician can ha can review that and, and, and have that call. And the third thing that we do, because you don't always know um, how serious, you know, sometimes youth will say something is really serious, but, it, you know, they need to sort of some help to sort of make that decision about what level of support they need. We do provide, um, we, we do explain to them that we're not an emergency service, but that if they are feeling that this is an emergency, here are the places that they can go, calling 911, accessing, that if it's not an emergency, but they need, you know, care that's not within what our, our scope that they can access their, their family health doctor. So we, do, we try to provide sort of immediately make sure that there's some a human person who is getting information that this child or youth is, is dealing with something that's really severe or or has worsened or is um, you know has indicated that there's plan and intent. We want to have some sort of immediate response to that so that the clinician can follow up. Um, but we do make it clear to them that it's not an emergency service and we try to provide access to those resources in their community that they can access that are going to be able to um, provide them with the level of support that they need. All right. Um, here's a good question about long, sort of the long-term uh, vision for this and sustainability long-term. She's asking who, who would monitor the site long-term and where would the funding come from to pay for professionals to monitor for risk, problem-solving support, etc. when youth have questions. So you know, long-term, once you're past the research phase, how, is there a funding model? Um, well, I mean, I think, like I said, the, the research phase is going to be quite long. And then I think one of the things that's going to come out of our, our pilot RCT is sort of the key, the key places that this makes the most sense. Um, you know, it might be that this, this makes the most sense with sort of like the school mental health nurses, and they would actually be the ones who, instead of having youth come in and have nothing to give them, they, they sort of work through the pro program with them and they use it as a resource. I mean, ultimately, with, with these kinds of things, in order to have sort of like wide uptake, you either have to go to, um, you know, a a paid model service or you need to have like provincial buy-in where um, they're going to help pay for you know highly trained professionals to 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 operate it in the terms of in, in the case of SFI what's really interesting is is they actually run as a nonprofit um, but they but they're but they are able to do the coaching and, and work through this material um, as a nonprofit so there's there's that option as well um, we're just we haven't really even thought about really the, the, the sort of the long-term funding beyond the, the funding that we need to make sure that we do the pilot RCT and then eventually, you know, a full-scale RCT at the end. All right. <clears throat> uh, this next question is from Sandra, and she's saying congratulations on this very exciting project. Um, she goes on to ask, uh, she also asks, there is some evidence for the support of, or for the value of supported self-management. It would be interesting mm -hmm. in your research to compare youth using this tool on their own versus youth using this in conjunction with the clinician. I completely agree with that. <laughs> and I mean, I think that's one of the interesting things too, that, that being able to have, the, understand more how people use these use these tools and, and actually navigate through the programs I think is going to be incredible data for us. We don't really have the same level of detail about how what happens in a face-to-face in -a -face sort of clinical um, clinical in environment so being able to think about what youth are actually doing in these online environments how can those sort of key areas maybe supplement or be a benefit to um, what's already happening with in, in a face-to-face -face sort of clinical experience or, or yeah, exactly I completely agree understanding where where we can leverage the best of both worlds or where we can replace a not so good world with something better um, I think is really exciting and I, and I hope that that's you know a part of what we do um, as we move forward. Uh, just another qu uh, sort of follow-up to, to the series of questions around uh, what happens when a, a youth is identified as at risk of, of harm. Uh, right. We talked about is a clinician notified or what have you. This person is asking, is their family contacted if there's uh, if someone's at risk? Um, interestingly enough, that's the whole issue of like how to involve, how much to involve families in this entire process is something that we're still sort of ongoing with. Um, I, I want to say yes, but we still haven't really sort of figured out completely and done sort of a full risk management review of everything that we're doing. So that may come up. I think that's, I'm going to actually write a note of that for that to be something that we talk about. One of the things that we sort of originally had talked about was letting parents know as kids were going through or, you know, but wanting to avoid telling parents, you, you know, your child hasn't completed whatever. We don't want to sort of create more conflict between parents telling youth that they haven't finished their work and things like that. Um, and also sometimes we know that with mental health things, parents can 
sometimes actually become over-involved and sort of um, micromanage their, their children's um, treatment. So we want to try to figure out how do we provide the best level of support and involve parents as, as best we can without sort of adding to the burden or creating more conflict for the youth in working through those things. Um, but in terms of the risk management, I think that's something that's going to be really important for us to figure out. Um, yeah, I think that's going to be something really important for us to figure out. So I, I definitely have a note of that about how much do we involve them or do we let them know that the coach has contacted them or do we just let them know that um, that they were having a difficult time. So yeah, all of those things are going to have to be filtered out before we're able to, to really launch the pilot. That was a really good question. Yeah. Um... This next question is about uh, what? Uh, uh, what's the anticipated period that a youth would work through all of the modules? Is it weeks, months, days? What? Right. Um, we, the other thing that Iris lets us do is it lets us do a couple things. We can lock and open um, content for however long. So we could open content and let them work through as fast as they wanted. So they could go through Iris in three days if they wanted to. Um, ideally, you know, I think eight sessions, we're thinking sort of eight weeks. Um, it would give them a chance to sort of work through the take-home activities and um, ha have a chance to sort of process the information that they're getting. There's a lot of sort of practice and like kind of trying to work through examples and there's a lot of concepts that get covered especially when it comes to those exposure activities we want to give them lots of time between modules to actually practice those might take a couple of weeks in between so at least eight weeks um, the sessions themselves don't take that long to complete but I think um, but for example the first module is a lot of input so they're putting in a lot of information about themselves and their lives their interests that's a bit of a heavy module um, and then some of the modules are a little bit lighter because we really just want them to, to take away the, the key nuggets and go and practice and come back with some feedback and some reflections about what worked and what didn't work for them. Um, but yeah, ideally, you know, a couple of weeks. We can, like I said, we can we can lock the content so that actually they can only access a module once a week. We can open it up. We can um, have it that they can't access the second module until they complete the first module. Um, we're able to, to lock and open um, the content depending on um, depending on what we think is the, is the best strategy. And it is designed to be progressive module one through eight. It's not where you would yes. skip some yeah. or no. Okay. Yeah. Well, mainly because mainly because when we get to exposure, we'd like to them to have worked through the relaxation techniques and sort of thought about how to build a plan. So the skills sort of build up to those to those three modules where they're actually working through facing their fears, and um, and doing that with a plan. So it's they could technically go and look at it, but I don't think the value would be there um, if they hadn't worked through the, the previous material. Right. Uh, it was mentioned that uh, young people and parents prefer informal and general sources of help over specialist mental health professionals. Yeah. Can you can you tell us where that information came from? I, I don't have it with me right now, but I can definitely post the resources along with the other things. Yeah, there was a I didn't add the resources to every slide, but I, I will post that as well. Okay, and we can post that up on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Yeah, definitely. All right. Uh, have you have you involved youth in? Uh, in the creation of the tool to get their feedback to see if it meets their perceived needs? Yeah, we did have a couple of youth volunteers that we worked with um, here at the hospital and um, there, we have youth, actually we just finished having four or five youth do complete the usability study for the first four modules so we're getting great feedback from them about about the process. We did, a, I, I think I mentioned we did a nationwide contest for youth to rename Wired and they the name they chose was actually breathe so now we're going to be working with them and a local um, media developer some youth and a local media developer to develop a logo for that um, so yeah I think I think we are trying to involve I worked we worked some with uh, the teen mental health nurses at the local high schools one of the challenges that we have in terms of working with youth as a research study is obviously the ethics and working through the school system requires a pretty significant amount of, of ethics time that we don't have within our budget to, to do that but um, we're definitely in at this stage we're, we're spending a lot of our energies really working with youth and working through the content and working through the, the resources and the videos and uh, really trying to pull their expertise and what works and what doesn't and what doesn't make sense and um, where we, where is the best um, effort for from our perspective to ch make changes and make it a better tool that's more accessible and easy for them to use? Yeah. So uh, this next question is uh, is sort as you may have answered it already. Um, is is there a plan to test this with youth? And if yes, when and how will you get the youth to do the pilot? I mean, this is already happening, correct? Right? 
Right. So right now we're just at the phase of doing the usability testing. So really, that's a, it's, think of it as like a formative assessment where we have the tool sort of in a in a beta version that we're t getting people to go through and say, I like this, I don't like this, I want to change this. We have like scratch audio versions for the video so we can ch go back and change those things. So right now we're working with youth right now to go through that whole usability process. Um, and if there were if there were youth that would be interested in doing that, I, I mean, we might be able to uh, incorporate a couple more youth into that process as well. Um, at that usability study, we, we already have five, but uh, then what's going to be happening is once we fit complete usability of the entire system, um, we're going to be doing a pilot RCT, which really isn't a full-scale RCT, but it, it's going to be um, when youth come to the ER at uh, several hospitals in Canada um, and they have, and the the crisis health team or the mental health worker assesses them as being there as for an anxiety related um, an anxiety related issue they're going to be given the opportunity to participate in the study and uh, and it'll be a random if they do agree to be participate it's going to be a randomized um, randomized to a group that uses the intervention and a group that just has access to a website that has listed resources so um, after we do the usability then we actually recruit um, youth through the emergency departments um, for a pilot RCT of, of the full-scale um, intervention. Uh, the, the next question is just asking, what's the process of using this tool starting from the emergency department? How does that process of activating the tool work? Um, they would come and get the information sheet about the research the research project. Then they will be if the parents contact the coordinator about participating. The coordinator will or the, the clinician will do some initial screening to make sure that you know the the level of need matches what um, Wired is really designed for. It's really not designed for necessarily um, you know children who are extremely depressed or have um, a sort of underlying other medical conditions that may be um, more serious and. Um, yeah, so there'll, there'll be sort of an initial screening process, and then the clinician will be able to go into the back end of Iris and set them up with a login, and really at that point, um, it's it's automated after that point. Um, youth go in and fill in all that information, and, and, and away they go for the intervention. So that's really um, what happens. They come into the ER. We know that um, a number, like youth, come into the ER for those sort of anxiety and stress-related incidents a lot, and uh, then it will be on the parents to sort of see if, uh, if they'd like their, 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 the youth to participate and um, we go from there. Well, much to my amazement, I think we've, uh, I think we're actually going to uh, get through all the questions in the allotted time. I wasn't sure Great. they were coming in fast and furious for a while. <laughs> we do have a couple of other sort of comments. A number of people are asking about when will this recording and the presentations and other resources be available. I should have okay. the PowerPoint slides up probably by the end of the day. I've been okay. pretty good recently about getting the edited video up by the before the weekend, so I don't expect that to change uh, this week. I should have this one up by, by Friday, but you will get a, an email from the system when that's available with a link to it. Uh, and then anything else, we'll, we'll continuously add resources as, uh, as uh, Dr. Wozni makes it available. As you've mentioned, the potential of, of posting up some of those sample videos or other references and that sort of thing. And anything yeah. that, that is that we are able to share, we'll put that up. Uh, over the uh, over the coming days, we did have a number of uh, a parent, for example, who is interested in uh, in connecting with you and perhaps giving some uh, insight. Oh, great! From her perspective. So again, that the Hillary's email address is up on the screen. So please do uh, contact uh, contact Hillary, and she can get you connected. Lots of people saying that the presentation was great and the tool looks very exciting, and they're very interested in seeing it launched, which, as you keep saying, will not be for a little while. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but that's been great. So I don't know if, if you have any final comments uh, that you'd like to, uh, before we close this off. No, I think it's great. I'm really excited to hear people um, curious about what's happening, and I think uh, we're doing it the right way. We're really trying to work through um, taking the beta version through with testing and uh, not launching before we're ready to go. So we'll keep everybody informed of how progress goes. Uh, all right, that sounds great. So this is, uh, I'd like to just take this opportunity to thank Dr. McGrath, who uh, had to leave us uh, about midway through the presentation, and Dr. Wozni, uh, and Hillary, who's in the background, not saying too much, but she's been a lot of help in helping, helping set yes, this up. Yes, she has. Um, but this has been a great presentation. I think, as you can see from the comments, lots of excitement and, and interest in this tool, and hopefully we can see it in the, in the not too distant future. But as I was mentioning, we do uh, we do post these recordings on the page. The page is up in front of you there. If you just go to ken.cafc.org, 
the, the first part of the URL you can see at the top of the screen there. Uh, that will uh, that that'll get you to the Knowledge Exchange Network, um, which is uh, which is here the main page, and you'll see the most recent activity on the right side. That this this presentation will be uh, will be you'll see, you'll see it pop up here in the activity stream once uh, we, we start adding stuff to it. So always go to the Knowledge Exchange Network if you want to see this webinar or, or any of our other webinars, which we typically do on Wednesdays at 11 a.m. Eastern Time. There will be a bit of a hiatus. They'll be a bit spotty over the summer uh, just because people are on vacation and it's tough to get uh, accommodate people's schedules. But come uh, September, we should be back on our weekly schedule of uh, Wednesdays at 11 uh, and if you do have any other questions or other, need other information about CAFC or any of these presentations, you can go to our website at CAFC.org and you can also go to the CAFC Presents uh, section of the, the website and there's a list of uh, upcoming presentations and other information. You can sign up for the mailing list up here in the top left and that'll uh, you'll get notified of all upcoming webinars. So. Uh, thanks again to Dr. Wozni, Dr. McGrath, Hillary, and everyone else that's been involved in this. Again, a great presentation and hopefully we'll thanks see so everyone much. on our next uh, webinar. Bye, everyone. Thanks so much, Doug. Yeah. Bye now.